morning family and welcome to our Sunday service. A special welcome to those of you joining us for the first time. Feel free to like and share the Facebook and YouTube videos of this teaching. We encourage you to let us know where you're watching from this morning and share your thoughts on the teaching in the live chat. Before we get to the word, there are a few announcements we'd like to make. A very happy birthday to Elsie, who celebrated her birthday this past week, and to Mama Renee and Sean, who both celebrate their birthdays today. Sean is celebrating his 50th birthday, and we wish him everything of the best. May the Lord richly bless you all. On Wednesday, we will host our Zoom House Church meetings at 7 p.m. The focus of discussion will be this morning's teaching entitled Revenge Part 3. Please review this teaching in preparation to share your insights at the house church meeting. A reminder to tune in to Thursdays with Thamo. These sessions are aired every Thursday at 5pm via Pastor Thamo's Facebook page and YouTube channel. The links are also made available in the church WhatsApp group. Our youth will meet on Friday evening at 7pm via Zoom. If you are between the ages of 13 and 20, this meeting is for you and promises an evening filled with the word and loads of fun. On Saturday, we will host our prayer meeting from 6.30 to 7 a.m. Feel free to join in as we pray for, amongst other matters, the purposes of God to be fulfilled within our lives personally and corporately as a household of faith. The church will be observing a five-day corporate fast from the 2nd of November to the 6th of November. The theme of the fast is Set Your House in Order, based on 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1. The focus will be the realignment of anything that is out of sync with God's predetermined plan and righteous standards for our personal and corporate existence. More information will be made available closer to the time. A reminder that our Sunday services are back at 9 a.m. every Sunday morning. We are now going to enjoy a time of worship. Feel free to sing along with us as we worship the Lord together. This will be followed by a few of the kids quoting a memory verse based on a recent Bible study. We will then hear the testimony of Bruce Eves, a spiritual son of the house, on how the subject of forgiveness has impacted his life. We trust you will be encouraged by this. Pastor Randolph will then share the word of the Lord with us before we partake of the table of the Lord together. Please have your communion emblems ready so that we may partake together. God bless and enjoy.
This week's memory verse is Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Thank you. Good morning, family. Hope you're all good. The scripture is coming from Galatians 5, verse 22, verse 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. Hello family, today's Bible verse is Galatians 5, 22-23. For the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Today, family, today my scripture is taken from Galatians 5, verse 22, and it says, For the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Thank you. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith gentleness, and self-control. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians 5 verse 22 and 23 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Good day, family. Today my scripture reading is taken from Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 and it says, But for the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Thank you. Hello, Auntie Renee. Today the memory verse is Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. Thank you. Galatians 5, verse 22 to 23. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians chapter 5. 5 verse 22 to 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians 5 verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is all. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, Oh God, you are the God of all created things Before the walls were formed, you knew who I would be Your ways are higher than the ways of man So help me trust your heart As you hold my hand on mountains high I'll praise your name In valleys low I'll do the same And as the river Runs to find the ocean blue My heart will always run To find you
Oh God, you are the God of all created things. Before the walls were formed, you knew who I would be. Your ways are higher than the ways of man. So help me trust your heart as you hold my hand on mountains high. I'll praise your name in valleys low. I'll do the same. And as the river runs to find the ocean blue, my heart will always run. My heart will always run to find Good morning, family. I count it a real privilege and an honor to stand here and to share testimony on how the current series that we are being taught, which is on forgiveness, has impacted my life. We have completed 17 sessions in this um, series with various subsections, but um, there's two things that have stood out for me that that has really changed me. The first is, um, how reflexive are we when the need arises for us to forgive? Or how reflexive are we when the need arises for us to ask for forgiveness? I think it's important in terms of uh, uh, restoring relationships that we become as reflexive as we can be. But the, the, the rate of our reflexivity, or at least the rate at which we reflexively forgive, is solely determined by the nature of forgiveness that we have inside of us. So the more of the forgiving nature we have, the more reflexive we will be. It needs to, be, it needs to get to the point where forgiveness is an automatic reflex when the need arises for it to be, whether it be us asking for forgiveness or whether it be somebody asking us for forgiveness. And I can share a personal testimony on how that reflexivity was put to test when I needed to ask a very dear sister in the Lord for forgiveness for something that I had done years ago that I didn't even remember. And it was, it was challenging, but the word that was inside my heart had caused me to immediately go and ask for forgiveness and then immediately make reparations and to ensure that the relationship was restored. And we can only become forgiving people or at least have our nature reflect forgiveness as that's more of Christ we have inside of us. So the more grace we have, the more we are able to, to forgive. The second part uh, that really stood out for me within these 17 sessions is exacting vengeance. Now, <clears throat> I didn't realize that there are so many subtle ways 
for us to exact vengeance upon the person that has wronged us um, that we don't even think we are doing. It's almost as if it is a, a subliminal uh, action uh, to us. It's, it also becomes reflexive as well, a, a reflexive acting of vengeance out on somebody. But, but what we've got to understand and what we were taught is that, is that the vengeance even the Bible says belongs to the Lord and um, we need to wait on the Lord to be able to to do what he needs to do in the life of the person that wronged us but what we what challenged me was was simply this was that if I truly love the way God loves me if love is perfected in me I then should behave in this manner somebody has wronged me Right? I then reflexively forgive that person. But it just doesn't end there. I should have enough mercy and grace and compassion in my heart for that person that I begin to pray for that person. I don't only pray for the restoration of their relationship, not only with me or, or with God, whoever it is that they need some sort of restoration for, but that I pray that whatever the consequences that God would want to meter out to that person, that, that they have the strength to get through it, but also that God would also not allow them to suffer unnecessarily. That is when I believe then, you know, we truly love the next person or we truly want relationships to be restored or we truly, or the true work of forgiveness, the complete work of forgiveness is actually evident in our lives. So I, I hope that's been a blessing to you. These, it's still extremely challenging. It's not easy. What I do know is that forgiveness cannot be based on any sort of emotion. Forgiveness is based on a choice. Uh, the healing of the emotions only start taking place once the choice to forgive has taken place. So I, I pray you've been blessed this morning. God bless you and have a great Sunday.
Good morning and welcome once again to Gate Ministries Durban Central. I am Randolph Barnwell, the Senior Elder of the Ministry. It's my joy to welcome all of you who have elected to view this broadcast today. I want to, before I enter the teaching, to just place on record our sincere thanks to the House for your faithfulness financially. Um, we believe in the practice of first fruits, tithes, and offerings, and many of you have been faithful even throughout this lockdown period to the Lord in reference to your diligence and consistency in placing God first financially. I want to encourage you to continue to do the same, for in this way you ensure sustained blessings upon your life and your family and I want to encourage those of you who perhaps wane in this regard to get back to a place of consistent obedience financially God is never first in your life unless he is first financially as well in the past I have taught an extensive series on financial principles governing the kingdom of God and I would encourage you to please consult this particular series on my website. Links to the relevant pages on my website will be placed in the comment section here below. Today I want to continue exploring the issue of forgiveness. Today represents session 18 in our exploration of the subject of forgiveness. But it also represents the third part in a subsection within this broad series in which we are dealing with the issue of revenge. So this is revenge part 3, forgiveness part 18. Now I want to kick off by reading a verse of scripture in Matthew chapter 24 and reading from verses 10 to 13. The Bible says the following, Then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures until the end shall be saved. I want you to, on your screen, notice the words which are reflected, emboldened. Notice the scripture says, many will be offended. The result of that will be betrayal. They will betray one another. The result will be also hatred. And then deception becomes inviting or runs rampant. Resultantly, the love of many will grow cold, but the person that endures to the end will be saved. So, in this passage of Scripture, Jesus said that some will become offended, and the result of that offense will lead to betrayal. And then you will have expressions of hatred. And then that person becomes prone to deception. And the love of many for each other and for the Lord will start to wax cold. But he that endures until the end, that person shall be saved. In life, you will probably be hurt by many people circumstances and scenarios and the possibility for being offended and for holding offense that would probably lead to bitterness and unforgiveness which might escalate to active seeking of revenge whereby you want to make the person suffer or incur penalties for their levels of hurt, hatred, betrayal, 
against you, that will be heightened. So what Jesus was saying is where you have offense, there it will result in betrayal and hatred. And then he said this, many will be deceived because of this. So deception becomes inviting or an option for the person that is offended. Offense is not innocuous, it's not innocent. It opens the door to the satanic realm of deception. Now, many people that harbor unforgiveness or harbor bitterness and seek revenge never ever think that they are opening their lives to satanic invasion. And I want to encourage you this morning that revenge is not a light thing. To harbor it is not something that you can simply think lightly of. It has very, very, very serious ramifications for at least satanic influence within your life. Again, I want to highlight in this verse, if you look at it on your screen, Jesus highlights the issue of offense, betrayal, hatred, deception, and then the love of many growing cold. Now, deception is a work of Satan. Wherever you have the issue of deception, you can almost guarantee that Satan is at work. So the person that entertains bitter revenge sets himself up for being deceived. And when a person is deceived, the very nature of deception is this. You think you're doing the right thing, but in fact you're doing something totally opposite to the requirement of God for your life. Nobody who is deceived believes they are deceived. It's the very nature of deception, not to make the person aware of their thought processes or their behavior. And so what this scripture teaches is that offense will set you up ultimately for um, this level of deception. And notice in context of this scripture, Jesus said that this offense will lead to betrayal and even hatred. So I will demonstrate to you in a short while this very scenario, how someone's offense leads them to betray brother and father. In James chapter 3 and verse 13 to 18, this is a passage that has featured quite frequently throughout the series, especially when we discuss the issue of bitterness. I want to reread it again, simply to highlight how there is a satanic element at work whenever these issues are accommodated within our lives. Verse 13, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, notice, natural and demonic. So there is a wisdom that is earthly, natural and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. Not some evil things, every evil thing. But the wisdom, by contrast from above, is first pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering and without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now, I've discussed the issue of bitterness and its association with jealousy and selfish ambition in a previous teaching. And I will encourage you to please consult my series on bitterness just before we started the forgiveness series. But where you do have issues of jealousy, bitterness, 
selfish ambition, you can almost be guaranteed that unforgiveness lurks in the background. And what James is teaching us, he is saying two things. There are two kinds of wisdoms that one can operate in. A wisdom that is earthly and a wisdom that is heavenly. A wisdom that is natural and a wisdom that is supernatural. A wisdom that is demonic or a wisdom that is thoroughly Christ-like and demonic. On your screen you will see a table in which I compare these two. You can see on your left the wisdom from below, on your right the wisdom from above. James says the one is earthly, natural and demonic. By contrast the other would then be heavenly, spiritual and godly. And issues like jealousy, selfish ambition are informed by a wisdom from below. And there you have disorder and every evil thing. And then he says the wisdom from above is manifested by its characteristics in that it's pure, it's peaceable, it's gentle, it's reasonable, it's full of mercy, full of good fruits, unwavering and without hypocrisy. So what James is saying to us is this. I just want to quickly summarize um, his main thought. James is saying this. There is an intelligence, a wisdom, a manner of thinking that is from the domain of the demonic, thoroughly influenced and informed by Satan. On the other hand, there's the wisdom that comes from above. The wisdom or manner of thinking, the intelligence that comes from the earth that is natural and demonic, its fruit you will have disorder or confusion and every evil vice, every evil thing. But the wisdom that comes from above is pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, full of good fruits, unwavering and without hypocrisy. And I want to encourage you that when you adopt an unforgiving, vengeful disposition, what you do is you adopt a mindset, an intelligence or manner of thinking that is informed by the domain of the demonic. You give Satan an open door for intrusion into your thought processes. Now, I want to demonstrate this by looking at a specific case study. It concerns one of David's sons, Absalom, who killed his half-brother Amnon, another son of King David. Now, this narrative is laid out for us in 2 Samuel chapter 13. And uh, you're going to have to read this chapter and the ensuing chapters to get the details of the story. But I just want to read to you my brief, succinct summation of the story. And then we can extrapolate some principles in which I hope to teach that vengeful intent does not have a good ending. right? Because when you are full of offense, unforgiveness, and seek to take revenge of the person that hurt you, for example, you go on a downward spiral of hate, betrayal, you open the door to satanic deception, you open the door to a satanic wisdom that is of the earth, it's natural and thoroughly demonic, and your end cannot be good. I don't know of any person that harbored vengeful intent whose end turns out well. And I will demonstrate how you will see in this narrative the end of Absalom certainly does not turn out well. So here's the story in brief. David had several children. There are 19 sons of which we know of. 13 were born to him in Jerusalem, and the first six were actually born to him at Hebron. And these were born to him from many wives. He also had other sons and daughters. 
One of his daughter is mentioned by name. Her name is Tamar. What had happened was David's eldest son, his firstborn, Amnon, raped his sister Tamar. Absalom was so angry that Amnon had raped his half-sister that um, he sought to take revenge upon Amnon. And he, he, he basically orchestrated a plan over a two-year period. So what happened is after the rape, Absalom brought his sister Tamar to live with him. And for over two years, his anger, his vengeful intent towards Amnon grew and grew and grew. Ultimately, he devised a plan in which he welcomed all the king's sons with David's approval to a feast, a party, a banquet. At this event, Absalom murders his brother Amnon for the rape of their sister Tamar. For this act, Absalom runs, he flees to a city called Geshir, where he would stay for the next three years. King David obviously is in grief over the death of his eldest son, Amnon, and that being by the hands of his other son, Absalom. While Absalom was away from Jerusalem, for three years in Geshir, David not once sought to go after him, nor to uh, speak to him. David also did not um, uh, correct nor chastise Amnon for the rape of Tamar. Eventually, with the help of and the persuasion of, of David's general Joab, David is persuaded to bring Absalom back to Jerusalem. But even in bringing Absalom back to Jerusalem for the next two years at Jerusalem, David never sees him, goes after him to speak to him. Eventually, again, through the help of Joab, uh, David is cajoled, persuaded to have an audience with him. When they do meet, Absalom prostrates himself towards his father. And so they're back in relationship, as it were. In time, Absalom contrives a wicked plan to unseat and overthrow his father David from off the throne. What he would do is he would meet men at the gate, men that would come to see David over matters for which they needed David's judgment on. And he would stop them at the gate. The Bible says that he was extremely um, well looking, an extremely handsome man. In fact, there was none in all Israel, the scripture says, as handsome as he. So he used his sense of physical appeal, the art of persuasion. And what he would do is he would meet these men, intercept them at the king's gate, and he would offer them better solutions to their problems than David would have. And so the scripture says he would win the hearts of the men progressively over a period of time away from David to himself. After a period of time, the Bible says he went to a city called Hebron and there he carried out this plan of rebellion to overthrow David. By this time, he had a huge following of men within Israel. David ultimately had to flee for his life. In time, Absalom would be killed by David's general Joab. And so David is restored back. David obviously weeps for his son Absalom. That's the story in a nutshell. Again, I'm leaving out the details of the story. Please consult 2 Samuel from chapter 13 onwards for yourself to get thoroughly familiar with the details. But what issues can we learn from this narrative? 
Firstly, Absalom could never forgive Amnon for the, mer for the rape of Tamar. They were both from the same family. Although they had different mothers, they shared the same father. In essence, they were family. In essence, they were brothers. So Absalom could not practice the principle of forgive your brother of an offense. And I want to encourage you, perhaps um, you might be experiencing a situation in which you can't bring yourself to forgive someone that's even within the kingdom. Because in your mind, the severity of the offense is far too grievous. Now, I think that Absalom probably reasoned like this. The offense, or the crime rather, of a rape, and this is not even a rape from a stranger. This is a rape within David's household, where one of his sons rapes his own daughter. To Absalom's mind, he must have thought like this, this sin, this crime is too grievous for me to look at Amnon, my brother, and say, I forgive you. Instead, he concocts this plan of revenge and ultimately murders his brother Amnon. I want to challenge you to think like this. And here's the principle. The gravity of the offense against you or others which are close to you is no legitimization, is no excuse for you to harbor an unforgiving disposition within you. Never mind the level of the crime, never mind the closeness of the crime, never mind by who it was committed, whether someone far from you relationally or someone closely proximate in relationship to you. All these external factors do not justify your obedience to an internal principle, which is forgiveness. I want to challenge you, your decision to forgive must be rooted in your commitment to a principle of for forgiveness and must not be governed by anything external to circumstances surrounding the offense. I hear many people speak like this. I cannot forgive him. I cannot forgive her because of the nature of what they have done. The gravity of the offense or the nature of the offense is no reason to harbor unforgiveness within your heart. Also, the proximity of the person relationally to you is also no um, license to entertain an unforgiving heart towards them. You are not justified to go on a vengeful path to another based upon the proximity of relationship. Now, when I reference proximity of relationship, this could work in one of two ways. Number one, people are more prone to forgive people with whom they are not proximate. If the relationship is far or even unrelated to them, you're more easy or prone to forgive them of even a grave offense. Now that is true for some individuals. And yet it's the opposite might be true for another group of people. It was certainly true for Absalom. Absalom certainly perhaps expected better from Amnon. For Absalom, because you were close, I cannot forgive you. Right? For some people, it's because you are far, I can forgive you. It's easier, some people argue, to forgive someone that is unrelated to you. And then they would argue it's far more difficult to forgive someone who is close to you that hurt you. And yet some people can forgive some with whom they are close 
because sentiment will override principle. So this could work either way. Now, might I say, whether the person is proximate or not, close or not to you, must not govern your commitment to forgive. Do not be governed by the closeness of the person or the distance of the person relationally to you. Obviously, it hurts more when they are close. I've said this to you previously. It's not so much what was done to you, but who has done it. And sometimes who has done it hurts us more than what was done. I think both factors played a part in Absalom's experience. What was done was grievous. A rape by any account is a grievous offense. But who did it? One within the household. A brother um, from whom you would expect would not violate members of his own household. Might I also just add a third factor here. So don't Number one, don't determine your forgiveness commitment, your commitment to forgive based upon the gravity of the fence. Don't determine your commitment to forgive based upon the proximity of relationship of your offender. And thirdly, I want to add this, don't determine your commitment to forgive based upon the frequency or infrequency of the offense. Jesus taught us in two separate accounts to forgive 70 times 7 and also seven times in the same day. Now I also want to challenge us on another principle. Absalom could not forgive Amnon because perhaps he was the brother from another mother. They shared the same father in David. Amnon's mother was a Hinoham, and Absalom's mother was Makkah. So they had different mothers, but they shared the same father. And sometimes we fail to forgive the brother from another mother as we would forgive the brother from the same mother. I want to remind you at this point, in a prior broadcast, we thoroughly prosecuted the forgiveness that Joseph offered to his brothers. And Joseph practiced this principle of forgiving the brother from another mother. He was able to forgive his brothers who were not from the same womb. And I want to encourage us all. God is our father. We have a common father. But you might be nurtured by different contexts to form Christ in you. I, I know of some individuals that are more prone to forgive members from within their household, their church, than they would forgive members from another household. More easier to forgive members from the same network than from another network. More prone to forgive people from the same relational sphere than they would from a relational sphere that is a pattern that is perhaps somewhat distant from the immediacy of their relational context. Now, if you behave that way, it means you are hypocritical because you have standards, different standards, or a set standard for one and that you have for, for others that might belong to a different context. Now, the scripture says that when Absalom organized this party in which he orchestrated the murder, he plotted the murder of his brother Amnon, that when this happened, all the king's sons, all David's sons present at that particular occasion fled. They simply ran for their lives. They were probably thinking, who's next? If Absalom could have killed Amnon, who is next? So every other son of David suddenly became insecure and they fled for their lives. The principle that the Holy Ghost um, asked me um, to 
make known today is this. Vengeful intent in one son left unchecked can destabilize an entire family, can destabilize an entire household. Because of the strong satanic spirit, there's a satanic wisdom that is now present within Absalom. He's not functioning by the wisdom that is first pure and then peaceable. So it destabilizes whole households. And I want to encourage anyone that is listening. The vengeful intent that you harbor towards a brother, especially one within the same household, goes far more and concerns far more than you. It actually will destabilize the family ethos, the spirit of oneness, of love, within whole families and could potentially abort kingdom purpose vested in and through the leader of that household. If Absalom's attempts against King David were successful, this could have potentially aborted divine purpose attendant with David. So it's a very strong spirit that needs to be checked. Now, when Absalom murdered Amnon, here is a commentary concerning this event. 2 Samuel 13 and verse 32 says, By the intent of Absalom, this has been determined since the day that he violated his sister Tamar. Now, from the day of Tamar's rape, two years later, the murder was orchestrated, was carried out. So in two years, the bitterness, the unforgiveness within Absalom's heart grew with greater intensity, greater fervency, until the day he carried out the murder of his brother. Now, here I want to challenge us with a thought. People often say that time heals. Well, time did not heal Absalom's bitterness. It's a fallacy that time heals. Time does not heal. It's what you do in time that heals. And what you should do in time in reference to offenses leveled against you, hurts, betrayals, etc., is you should simply forgive. Time doesn't heal. Forgiveness heals. Or at least forgiveness initializes and aids and accelerates the healing process. For those of you that think, well, I'm feeling this angry, I'm feeling this hateful against the person that hurt me or someone close to me. Um, and I'm just going to leave it be. I won't address it. I will perhaps try and banish it to the back of my mind. I want to encourage you, don't do that. Don't rely on time to heal your offense. Your wound will not be healed left to time. You can heal it in time, yes, simply by an act, a decision to forgive the person that hurt you. Further, Absalom probably felt um, that David, his father, did not act justly. And perhaps this tr is true and was a weakness of King David. David did nothing to correct Amnon's rape of Tamar. He was angry, the Bible says, but that's all it says. Um, by law, in Leviticus, is, it's very clear that his actions warranted death. So David does, does nothing to correct the sin of Amnon. And probably, this is what I feel, was Absalom's reason for hating his father David so much that he planned an overthrow of David's kingdom. Many, many times when we are hurt, 
we are not just hurt by the person who was responsible for the hurt, but we also too become hurt by others who stood by and did nothing. Probably Absalom expected more from his father David. He probably thought, my father, you should have brought Amnon, my brother, to book. You should have applied the death penalty. But David does nothing, even to voice an objection to Amnon's wicked behavior. So Absalom harbors bitterness, not just to Amnon, his brother, but to David, his father, who did nothing. I think it was Plato who said that silence gives consent. And by this he is meant that whenever you are in a position to stop uh, a crime, for example, or to correct it, and you do not do so, that in fact you endorse the crime, and then you become complicit to it. It might not necessarily be true, but that is generally the way people perceive of it. So, for example, in a home in which, let's say, a child has been uh, sexually abused by a father, for example, that child can grow up hating the father, being unforgiving to the father, but also to a mother who did nothing to correct the actions of that father or even to voice um, the disapproval of those actions when it was within the scope of their power and opportunity to do so. Now, if you are such a person that feels likewise, my challenge to you today is to forgive the perpetrator. Yes, forgive the person that hurt you and also forgive everybody else that you think gave consent to the actions of the person that hurt you by virtue of their silence. The fact that they did nothing. Sometimes you feel aggrieved more by that than by the actions of the person that actually hurt you. And so, yeah, I believe this was Absalom's issue with David his father. Now, there are many, many other um, principles here that I want to draw reference to. But I want to just bring this to a close by saying this, that, that many times in our walk in Christ and we become offended at one level or the other by people that inflict pain or hurt upon us in, in some way. We feel aggrieved and uh, we, we entertain the notion of revenge. When we do so, we open ourselves to entertain the prospect of betraying people that are close to us. And we open our minds to satanic deception and we embark upon actions that ultimately would land us in deep trouble. The story plays itself out where Absalom would eventually die at the hands of Joab, who is David's general. It does not end well for Absalom. And it certainly will not end well for you. And I want to encourage every single one of us not to entertain these vengeful ideas towards people that have hurt us or to those who stood by doing nothing when they had occasion to do so. You know, part of Absalom's transformation, he, his whole nature transforms into something very, very evil. And I have seen how good people turn evil simply because someone hurt them. And they could not master forgiveness towards this person. And I've seen good characters transform overnight into something ugly. And some of them never recover from their state, as Absalom never recovered from his state. When Absalom came back from Geshur to Jerusalem, 
and eventually after two years had an audience with his father the Bible says that he prostrated himself before David now this prostration was hypocritical because within his heart there was vengeful intent even towards his father David you must be careful of those that bow before you in seeming loyalty yet within their hearts they are they they harbor ill towards you also be careful of those that use their charm that use flattery as a cloak uh, to mislead you to drop your guard so that they can lead you into a rebellious plot what happened is like i said absalom used his charm he was an extremely handsome man with long hair and the bible says there was there was no one more handsome in all of israel than absalom and he used his way with words the art of persuasion to persuade men at david's gate to follow his lead and the bible says these men followed absalom in a rebellious plot that he harbored in his heart to unseat his father from the throne they followed absalom in the integrity of their hearts and this is a caution to many that might be listening today be careful of being hoodwinked by someone with vengeful intent in their hearts that uses their charisma um, certain um, sensual external traits about themselves in a bid to seduce you but they rely on your integrity to follow them through but they mislead you by giving you misinformation false information because they harbor uh, a wicked plot within their hearts but they need to recruit you on their team don't go in hook line and sinker and I, I want to encourage all those who might be listening to us I just feel this this warning from the Lord be careful of flattering lips in this regard I want to read the following scriptures Romans 16 and verse 17 says now I urge you brethren note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them for those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple in proverbs 26 and verse 28 a lying tongue hates those it crushes and a flattering mouth works ruin proverbs 29 verse 5 a man who flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his steps psalm 5 verse 9 there's nothing reliable in what they say the inward part is destruction itself and their throat is an open grave they flatter with their tongues absalom stood at the king's gates and he offered better solutions to people that came for counsel to his father David in essence he discredited David in a hope to credit himself now what I want to encourage those of you that are listening you must be careful of this tendency this trait within vengeful persons whereby you, you hope to earn points for yourself at the expense of discrediting the worth of another now you cannot hope to ascend by causing somebody else's descent never ever seek to thrive at somebody else's demise never seek to go upward but simultaneously put someone downward always watch for these things these are traits within vengeful people that find expression 
And may, the, may your eyes be opened. May your senses be awakened to within your world. This is a caution. Watch for people that cannot forgive, have a vengeful intent within their hearts and are hoping to enlist you on their team. They trust your integrity. They trust your uprightness. But a spirit of deception becomes very strong at work such that even people of integrity can be caught up in somebody else's wicked scheme. And this is a caution to many within our house and for those of you that are listening. Do not be caught up in a battle that is somebody else's. Because you might just be fighting King David. You might be embroiled in a war against um, principles or persons on whom God has got his hand and his, his favor upon. You know, the, the, the sad thing about Absalom is that at the end of his life, um, it says that sons were born to him. Three sons were born to Absalom. But in his words, his own uh, uh, testimony is this. He says, I have no sons to keep my name in remembrance for myself. In other words, he has no legacy. He does not build something of significance in the earth whereby God can look upon and say, I can offload purpose in your family and transmit that from one generation to the next. All the scripture says is that Absalom would set up a pillar for himself, a kind of monument to hold him in remembrance in the minds of people. Although he produced sons, he never had sons that would continue purpose and legacy from one generation to the next. Now, I want to encourage you uh, not to return evil for evil, insult for insult. If injury has been done to you, do not retaliate with a satanically designed, uh, uh, revengeful, bitter, unforgiving spirit, because that will certainly bring death to your destiny. I want to close with this verse. 1 Peter 3 verse 89 says the following. To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil, insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. I want to leave this verse of scripture. This verse says very plainly, for this reason, we are all called to inherit a blessing. But usually the path to blessing is fraught with evil and insults leveled against us. All God is saying, do not respond evil for evil, insult for, in, for insult, but instead give a blessing. As I taught you last week, do good. Pray and fast for those that hate you. And when you do this, the scripture says, in this way you will inherit a blessing and not a curse. Unfortunately for Absalom, his life ends in a curse. The curse of premature death, the curse of not fulfilling divine purpose within his life, simply because of a failure to respond appropriately to a very grievous scenario within his life. Failure to respond in honor, even to his father David, who in his mind failed to act appropriately. In that scenario. I want to encourage you um, to forgive. I wrote in my notes here, even forgive persons which might have long been dead, but while they were living, you never had the occasion to express your forgiveness to them or even ask 
for forgiveness from them if you have hurt them. I will encourage you, uh, don't just let time pass and think time will heal everything. If someone has hurt you and they are dead, then just by an, a decision and act of your will, forgive them before God in prayer. Say, Lord, I forgive them. I don't hold that against them. God will see your heart and God will exonerate you from any negative repercussions for maintaining an unforgiving disposition within your heart. I want to challenge you again with Peter's words, to this you are called, to this we are called, that we might inherit a blessing. A blessing awaits every single one of us when we function in a disposition of forgiveness. Amen. Would you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your word. I pray, O oh God, that this word would settle within every single one of our hearts. I ask, O oh God, that you would rid us from vengeful intent. Forgive those that have hurt us because we forgive them. We release everyone that has hurt us. We release those that have stood by in silence and they have done nothing as well. Father, we learn this principle from this lesson of Absalom's experience, not to harbor bitter hatred. It ultimately leads to murder. It leads to betrayal. It leads to deception. It invites satanic intent to have its way within our lives. We don't want that wisdom. We want the wisdom that comes from above, that is pure, that is peaceable. That is, that is reasonable, Father, that is gentle, full of good fruits. Father, I pray that wisdom, that mindset, that intelligence will be our portion in the name of the Lord Jesus. Right now, we bless those who have hurt us. We don't curse them. We pray your blessing. We pray success upon our greatest Greatest haters, greatest enemies, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I know, O oh God, that when we adopt this mindset, that your word says we will inherit a blessing. For to this we indeed are called in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. As we come to celebrate the Lord's Supper, I want to encourage you to get your communion emblems ready. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 23, it says, speaking of the Lord Jesus, He did not retaliate when He was insulted. When He suffered, He did not threaten to get even. He left His case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. Jesus is our supreme example. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, did not threaten to get even, no vengeful intent within his heart. And this text says, in doing so, he left it into God's hands, who always judges truly. And as we celebrate communion, as you receive his body and his blood, as he is, so are we within this world. If he could do this, if Jesus, the patent son, our supreme example, could harbor no vengeful intent. You know, the Bible says on the cross he could have called for legions of angels to come at his assistance, but he did not. He left judgment in the hands of his father because he knew the principle vengeance is mine declares the Lord as you celebrate the Lord's Supper may you receive a new forgiving disposition may your forgiving quality escalate to a brand new level in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ amen receive his body and drink his blood Great grace and peace be with you all and I want to encourage you to join us for 
our last segment in this series on forgiveness next week Sunday at 9 a.m. God bless you. Amen.